Yes, so right now the ways to get to the International Space Station are with uh, SpaceX and Dragon. That's part of the commercial crew program. Of course, we still have, uh, we still trade seats with uh, the Soyuz for the Russians. Uh, but uh, in case any one of those uh, go down, it's great to have another one to go. And not only that, it's, it's important for NASA uh, that we have many different ways to the International Space Station for crews and cargo, but it's also really important uh, for this low Earth economy that we're building, uh, so that we can have uh, different ways for Americans to go into space that aren't necessarily for NASA. And actually, we are getting our first look inside of the historic suit-up room within Kennedy Space Center's Neil A. Armstrong Operations and Checkout Building. Our first views of NASA astronauts Butch Wilmore and Sonny Williams. We have a close-up now of Butch there getting seated and situated before what we expect to be a suit leak check for him, right, Mike? Yes, so uh, these suits, uh, not only are they uh, by David Clark in uh, Worcester, Massachusetts, and uh, Reebok is also another Massachusetts company, so they work together for some cool space boots, but you can see Sonny is enthusiastic and uh, very excited today. Right. Uh, uh, but uh, that's uh, that's good. That, that uh, shows that we get up to uh, about 3.6 pounds per square inch of pressure, uh, which will uh, help us uh, help the crews uh, stay alive if there's a major cabin leak, and that's uh, that's a good thing. Uh, we Boeing and NASA really care about uh, crew safety for sure. There is a lot to learn about this crew flight test, so we have people here at the Cape and in Texas to help explain every part of this mission. Let's start first with ULA's Dylan Rice and Boeing's Lawrence Frenicky, who are monitoring the spacecraft for the pad team to start making their way back over to the pad uh, because Dylan fueling. And with the uh, launch vehicle ready, we started cryogenic tanking at uh, 6.25 a.m. after completion of our pre-cryo built-in hold. Um, cryogenic tanking takes just under two hours to complete. Uh, that just wrapped up here in the past few minutes and uh, the uh, teams are now polling downstairs to uh, initiate re-entry of pad 41 so that we can uh, bring the, uh, the, the team out and start loading uh, crew in the Starliner. Um, as you know, our last time we got together, we had it um, during our uh, during our downtime here. So uh, that is the status of the uh, rocket launch. Yeah, and Dylan, Starliner really had a very clean countdown during the last launch attempt. But it wasn't until after that scrub that we started saving the propulsion system and closing the valves and observed a small helium leak in the port side manifold. So we and we'll keep you posted on that. While investigating the cause of the leak, engineers also discovered that in an unlikely scenario, if that option were needed, Starliner could do two burns about 10 minutes each and 80 minutes apart with only four RCS thrusters. In the last few weeks, the crew ran these scenarios craft and its systems for the future, and we're already looking at a handful of long-term solutions for Starliner's post-certification missions. Now let's check in with NASA's Daryl Nell at nearby Hangar AE. He is keeping an eye on the weather for us and NASA's oversight of today's flight test. Daryl. That's right, Lauren. Stronger uh, than uh, normally we would have expected, but we've got strong onshore flow from a high-pressure system that's just off the coast of North Carolina, and so that's creates stability for violation. Overall, though, we couldn't be in a better position. We were in a similar position during our last launch attempt, and come to find out, even though it's the beginning of meteorological summer, we're not having summer conditions here at the pad yet, and that's a good thing. So we'll send it now back to the host desk with Megan, Mike, and Dean. Carol is absolutely right. We uh, know these winds very well as they are whipping around us right now. And, and Mike, talk to us about why uh, these winds would be a concern for launch. Well, here at NASA, it's uh, safety first. So Butch's ear cups uh, is also uh, gives uh, 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 head protection too. So it's a, it's a, it's a very uh, smart system and we call it a crew head protection assembly or something like that or a chippa. So Butch is now taking off his chippa and you can see he, he cut his own hair for the flight today. <laughs> this is the kind of insight we wanted from you, from you, Mike. As you can see, guys, we are very fortunate to have Mike here with us because he's a veteran of three space flights, Expedition 9 in 2004, 
also Expedition 18 in 2009, as well as STS-134 in 2011. We're cycling through some pictures of those previous flights now. In total, he spent more than a year in space and has conducted nine spacewalks. He then worked with, the, with NASA's commercial crew program to help bring SpaceX's Dragon and now Boeing Starliner uh, online and ready for today's flight test. He trained alongside Bush and Sonny as their backup pilot and was with them for CFT's first launch attempt. We actually saw him in the suit up room here snapping pictures and then he rode out to the launch pad with them where he snapped a few more pictures before handing off some of Butch and Sonny's belongings to the pad team. Operational mission after CFT, so really important for you to be engaged and, and watching today. Oh, uh, absolutely, and, and that's the purpose of this flight is to, uh, to build uh, flight experience uh, and get certification so that we can have regularly scheduled flights of Starliner to the International Space Station, much like the other commercial crew partner of uh, SpaceX, and uh, we're going to get there. Uh, so Butch and Sonny as test pilots are going to get some really good data on how the Starliner really flies, uh, how uh, habitable and comfortable is it in there, is it extra humid, is it beautiful? We think it's going to be great, we've tested a lot on the ground, but we'll know for sure once we launch today. And as we take a captain, raised in Mount Juliet, Tennessee, and is married to Deanna Wilmore with two daughters. As a naval pilot, Butch racked up more than 8,000 flight hours and 663 carrier landings, all in tactical jet aircraft. He completed four operational deployments, supporting missions like Operation Desert Storm. Before his selection to NASA, Wilmore was on exchange to the Air Force as a flight test instructor at the Air Force Test Pilot School at Edwards Air Force Base in California. Butch is a veteran of two space flights as pilot on Space Shuttle Atlantis in 2009, and then in 2014, he served as flight engineer for Expedition 41 to the International Space Station. So for the astronaut in 1998, just two years before Butch, this will also be Sunny's third mission to space, making her the first woman on a test flight of an orbital spacecraft. Her first trip to the ISS launched in 2006. She served as flight engineer for Expedition 1450. She then returned to the orbiting lab in 2012 and was commander of Expedition 33. Sunny has more than 50 hours of spacewalk time, the second most cumulative time by a female astronaut. So far, she has spent 322 days in space. Before NASA, Sunny was a former naval test pilot and instructor, logging more than 3,000 flight hours in more than 30 different aircraft. Williams grew up in Eden, Massachusetts, and is married to Michael Williams. She enjoys hanging out with their dogs, working out, hiking and camping, as well as working on cars and houses. Both uh, very experienced. Plus 12 seconds, the rocket rolls, lining up Starliner with its target orbit and putting the astronauts in a heads-up position. Then, around T plus 40 seconds, max Q starts. That's also known as max aerodynamic pressure. This is a critical time when the atmospheric forces reach their heights. Next, at about plus one minute 35 seconds, the two solid rocket boosters run out of fuel and burn out, and about a minute later, they separate from the booster. The Atlas booster engine continues to burn for almost two more minutes. Then at approximately plus 430, booster engine cutoff, or BECO. About five seconds later, the booster separates and so does the ascent cover on top of Starliner. At around four minutes, 45 seconds, the Centaur upper stage ignites, continuing the push to orbital speeds. In a little after five minutes, Starliner is free of the atmosphere and doesn't need additional aerodynamic support and the aeroskirt is jettisoned. After a long six plus minute push from Centaur, main engine cutoff or MECO happens around 12 minutes after liftoff. Then when Centaur successfully separates almost 15 minutes after launch, ULA's job is done. But Starliner is not quite in orbit yet. After a 16 minute coast, Starliner ignites four of its orbital maneuvering and attitude control or OMAC engines for the orbital insertion burn. And then 31 minutes after liftoff, the ascent profile is complete. Exploration is curiosity. It's asking the question why. It's taking that next step. Every time we do something for the first time, we're expanding our knowledge. My name is Sunny Williams, and I'm the pilot for NASA's Boeing crew flight test mission to the International Space Station. I feel really lucky to have grown up in a small town 
outside of Boston, Lanita, Massachusetts. It was a great town because we were able to ride our bikes everywhere we went. My brother, sister, and I, we were all swimmers, and it was just a great childhood. My dad was a doctor and also did neuroscience research. We were the strange family who had pictures and diagrams and brains on our dining room table. My older brother went to the Naval Academy. I started researching a little bit and I thought, well, what the heck, I'll try this out. And when I went, I found that I really loved it. Teamwork, followership, leadership, those opportunities that we had right from the very beginning and to accomplish something a little bit bigger than yourself. And I think that paved the way for the rest of my career a basic engineering degree from the Naval Academy. I really didn't know what it was all about when I went through that course curriculum, but when I went to test pilot school, all of that stuff sort of gelled together. I was like, oh wow, this is why we do math modeling. This is how we try to predict how change in an engine is going to affect the way the helicopter flies. Time on the International Space Station is priceless. People always ask, you know, do you get bored or, you know, is it terrible being up there for a long period of time? And for me, I loved every minute. There was always something to do. You wake up, you look at your timeline like, wow, I got to do this experiment today. I got to get ready for a spacewalk. Every day was different. And just life on the space station becomes routine, which is sort of crazy to think about it. At one point in time on my first mission, I was like, I don't even remember really what it's like to walk. I've been flying around for so long. <laughs> I don't even know what it's like to sit down. I got assigned to the commercial crew cadre in 2015. We went to the companies, found out the shell of their programs, and then actually started working with them to make them what they are today to accommodate astronauts. For Starliner, we've been heavily involved in the last couple of years in the software with the folks doing the development to make sure its capability will allow us to come home. And we've been involved with all the suit development, making sure every different size of person could fit in all these suits and they could operate the spacecraft adequately. We've had our fingers on every single procedure that we work inside the cockpit, as well as operated it with our mission control team to make sure that everything that future crews will do will be right. We haven't had the classic training as we had for shuttle and Soyuz. We've sort of helped develop the training as well as the hardware. And this is sort of the shape of things to come as we get ready to go back to the moon. All of that is going to be developmental and we're going to have to have the same mindset. It's not already established. We all have to be part of this big team to help develop it and make sure that integration as the astronauts use all this equipment is going to be top notch and ready to take us even further. CST, you're to grab one. Please hold call, 30 Okay, so ground, uh, some com checks that you can hear there. But again, this is the traditional card game. You, hear, you see Sonny and Butch there uh, with uh, Joe Acaba, the uh, lead there uh, for the mission today. And I, I see two camera angles here for the first time, so we actually get to see their cards. But the point of this game, and of course, uh, Mike Fink and Megan will talk more about this, but as we're looking at it, since we're watching it now, they're playing a card game, and they're going to play this game until uh, the commander, uh, Butch, loses. And uh, the whole point of this is to take uh, all that, uh, any bad luck. They may have won, so we'll see. We'll see what's going on. Anyways, we also want to talk weather, uh, which is a, a factor, uh, not too much today. Only 10% uh, no-go. We are 90% go. Um, and so we're looking really good there outside, uh, but we do want to continue to, to watch this tradition, which goes all the way back to the space shuttle program. Butch observes, there's plenty of time in the timeline for this. Uh, they've, uh, they're suited up uh, uh, to be able to see this rocket. We have clear skies in the area thanks to the high pressure system. So most of the folks along the eastern seaboard should have a view. But again, as we start to go along. I think even some of the guys. Yeah, one got, uh, got a rose right there. It's the thought that counts, really. And uh, it's really, uh, they, they take such good care of us while in quarantine and Butch and Sunny. LC, uh, slick on uh, channel one. Longer quarantine than usual. Hatch open ops complete. Confined space checks are nominal. Roger. A wave there from Butch and Sunny as the elevator doors close. That elevator will then transport them down three floors. Anything they might experience in space, even zero gravity. They performed a lot of their training inside a real-size mock-up of Starliner at JSC, which just happens to be right across the room from a real-size mock-up of the International Space Station. 
And just down the road, they spent hundreds of hours inside Starliner's simulators, running through various possible scenarios they could face during this flight test. Now, Mike, when they returned to Houston after the first launch attempt, they actually did get back into some of these training simulators, right, to walk them through some of the procedures that they were testing given some of the issues that were found? Oh, oh very much so. Uh, Butch and Sonny, uh, as consummate professionals, uh, insisted uh, that uh, they keep up their, their skills, um, and not just their own skills, but uh, the skills of the entire team it takes uh, to, to go fly the to go, ouch, go fly the spacecraft. And uh, so uh, as we looked at uh, what to, how to handle a helium leak, we came up with new techniques and procedures, and Butch and Sonny uh, you know, were, were helping uh, work with the team to make sure that we have uh, everything in place in case we ever need it. So great resources available to them. Again, back in Houston there, their friend Mike here at the host desk applauding them from afar. Some roses still left in Butch's hand. I'm sure he'll hand them off to some of the crowd there that's outside of the ONC. I think his wife and daughters are there, so uh, he definitely wants to show appreciation for how patient his family has been. Well, you did say that uh, Butch and Sonny have been in quarantine for a very long time. Now, April 22nd is when they went into quarantine. Yeah, it's been a, been a long time. Uh, they were allowed to see their family, but from a distance. So uh, this is uh, as close as they've been for a while. Uh, but we do really respect the health stabilization program. We don't want our friends aboard the space station to, 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 to get sick and impact the mission for sure. Talk to us about the people who are here, right? And there's different tiers that uh, talk about or, or that uh, um, have to do with how close they can get to the astronauts, right? Uh, yes, uh, so uh, if, if other people have been in quarantine along with Butch and Sonny like uh, uh, like before, uh, then uh, they could get uh, really close. At this point, they, the crew has to maintain at least a six foot two meter distance and uh, they can see and talk to their talk to their friends, especially we're outside so the, and with this wind, uh, you know the, the, the chances of anything uh, you know, uh, uh, happening are, are very low. And then yeah, there's a lot of uh, a lot of uh, our team that are there, uh, and uh, we also have some uh, very important people like the you know the administrator and uh, other folks too. And I think I might need to go fly on, on a mission himself. Uh, we also see uh, in the distance uh, the uh, Boeing and astro NASA astronaut liaison uh, Megan Donaldson. She's been super helpful in, in uh, getting uh, this mission together and keeping uh, the crew pointed in the right direction and uh, being a very good liaison with the Boeing management too so that uh, that our voices are heard. Yeah, I think this scene here just shows again, uh, you know, a fraction of all the people that it takes to make this happen. The support of your family, the support of your friends, and then again, teams across both Boeing, NASA, uh, and ULA to make this crew flight test happen. Uh, lots of thumbs up from, uh, from Sunny there, lots of waves. They're making their way through the crowd now. They have still about a minute and 30 seconds built into this opportunity to say their final goodbyes before they get into that Astro van and head to the launch pad. What do you think's happening there, Mike? There's a there's a patting on the back there. What, what is that? <laughs> Well, uh, uh, Butch likes to uh, likes to give speeches, so I think Sonny is uh, is, uh, is sharing the excitement. We can see their helmets there hanging off of their suits. I remember the story that Butch said. He had this recurring nightmare that it would be launch day and he'd forget his helmet. So I'm pretty sure he loves the fact that they're attached to him there. Yes, it's uh, Butch proof. <laughs> Butch proof. <laughs> All right, so they're in the Astro van now. A quick note about the other folks who are in with them. You have the driver, Rodney Perry, and he said he couldn't pass up the opportunity to drive astronauts to a launch pad. Pretty cool. Three hours, 20 minutes. And then also the back of Wilmore and Sunny Williams, now en route to Cape Canaveral Space Force Station's launch pad 41. And as both Butch and Sunny make their way out to the pad, there's only one way for those two to get amped up for launch. And I know that Mike knows because he was inside the Astro van with them on their first ride out to the pad on the first launch attempt. They will be watching the Top Gun Maverick movie, or at least highlights from that movie. 
and they should be doing that right now inside the Astrovan, right, Mike? Oh boy, yeah, that's uh, one way to certainly get uh, to get uh, excited uh, for the mission and to uh, remind uh, Butch and Sonny that uh, yeah, hey, they're they're on an important mission and they're test pilots, and uh, that there's a, a wonderment uh, to uh, flying both aircraft and spacecraft. And, and of course, I think the Maverick uh, movie uh, brought, uh, brought that excitement of flying uh, to everyone. And so Butch and Sonny are going to have a few clips there, uh, the funny parts of the movie. The LC Slick on Channel 1. Go ahead. Crew Transport Convoy is en route to LC-41. Estimated arrival to roadblock at L-306. Roger. And a, a fun fact was uh, on the last uh, ride... Uh, OSM, LC. OSM, good, sir. Crew Transport Convoy is in route. Oh gosh, well I'm sure they appreciate it. You probably figured it out because they were able to watch it. So again, as mentioned before, uh, they probably really uh, relate to the movie. They're both experienced naval avi aviators. And here's actually a picture of Sunny back in the day. Uh, she initially wanted to be a diver in the Navy, but said she watched the first Top Gun movie and decided to go to flight school. And here's a picture of Bush. Fun fact, he was actually a real Top Gun pilot. So you see him there on the far left of the photo. To the far right, actually, is Chris Ferguson. We were talking a little bit about him, right, Mike and Andy? And another fun fact is, you know, this thanks Megan and go Butch and Sunny. Here in Houston, things have been going smoothly for the flight control team and mission control. The team here took control of Starliner a little less than an hour ago. They inside the Neil A. Armstrong Operations and Checkout Building at Kennedy Space Center lowered the Orion spacecraft into a vacuum altitude chamber with the help of a 30-ton crane. The chamber simulates deep space to test for any electromagnetic energy that could damage Orion as it travels away from Earth. Meanwhile, the Artemis II crew completed an underway recovery test at sea. This exercise mimics Orion landing and recovery procedures when the crew splashes down in the Pacific Ocean off the coast of California. Navy divers and boats approached a mock-up Orion capsule and helped the astronauts into helicopters, which then flew them to a nearby naval ship, just like they'll do during the mission. Back at Kennedy and high above launch pad 39B, this 360 degree video takes you for a ride inside one of the Artemis emergency egress baskets. In the event of an emergency at the launch pad, astronauts and workers use this quick exit to get to safety. That's a look at your Artemis Moon Minute. It's really cool to see all the way along uh, the eastern coast of Canada where they do have some cool water temperatures. That's a factor when the rescue teams, should they abort, have to go into the water. But as we understand it, the debt team, the military. Go ahead. Yes, sir, for step 150. Crew transport convoys bearing roadblock 18. The protection of astronauts riding atop Atlas V by autonomously monitoring the health of all the launch vehicle systems. If the system detects an impending anomaly, it can trigger an abort much faster than any human could do so, uh, but the astronauts also have the capability to trigger an abort if required. Along with that EDS system, we have a dedicated ascent flight control team on console in Denver uh, during the flight and uh, any human spaceflight mission that we support. Uh, this team monitors the health and performance of the rocket during ascent to space. Uh, our engineers provide real-time status and collaborate directly with NASA's flight director and mission control in Houston. When you hear the call sign Atlas, that's our ascent lead, and he'll be providing real-time telemetry data from the rocket and provide continued situational awareness. Crew is entering cat elevator. All right. Uh, and they went straight to the, uh, and they're going straight up, up the elevator right now, straight to the rocket. And I, I just, I just know what it feels like stepping out of the, the Astro van, and, and here they are, you know, ready, getting ready to uh, get inside. And it's just, uh, they're, it's a, a great a feeling of uh, satisfaction and accomplishment to be here at this day at this time. This is something that the, the whole team has been working for for, for many years. And you know it's different obviously since we're launching during the day they had great views of the of the rocket on their way to the pad so like you said they they probably uh, had their opportunity to look at their ride to space and now they just want to get in so now on level 12 of the crew access tower 
You see Sunny there with some of the pad team members. Butch went into that door there at the bathroom. And this is an important yeah. step <laughs> in the countdown, obviously. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, uh, I was on Daniel Tiger, uh, a TV show, and we had an episode go, Go Before You Go. And so this is what we teach all of our kids is, uh, yeah, should, before a long period. Some phone calls. I just heard that they also made another phone call while on their way out. Uh, they called Mark. Made and I'm glad he got a phone call. Yeah. A view of the crew access arm. From our helicopter that we have flying around the pad right now. We see Sunny there on the railing taking a look out. Yeah, you could you can get a great view from up there. Who needs to get out of the Astro van and recline up? <laughs> so uh, yeah, this is the uh, last time for for a while that Sunny's going to have the the breeze in her face and the smell of the ocean air and, uh, and the joys of being on planet Earth. Uh, now she's going to see it all from from a great distance. And here it looks like Butch is now back with the oh, cast and Sunny. An ordained minister, probably the sorry, on that channel prayer now. Ingressing into the spacecraft and launching to the International Space Station. Well, they just uh, cleared the crew transport vehicle to go away, so Butch and Sunny are stuck there now, so they might as well go launch. <laughs> and here they are walking across the crew access arm. Butch nope. stopping to take a quick look at his spacecraft and launch vehicle. And you can see they, they stepped on that little white sticky mat to make sure that uh, anything that they may have had on their boots uh, doesn't get inside the spacecraft and possibly into the space station. We do try to keep a, a very clean ship uh, both up and down and aboard the space station. Looks like they're saying a, a quick prayer for a successful mission. Yeah, these are other uh, PAD team members who uh, are in the white room now with Butch and Sunny. Uh, before they get into the Starliner spacecraft. It's environmentally controlled to keep out dust and dirt and humidity. It's actually a little bit overpressured, so it's, it has more pressure inside so that uh, no, no air can come inside and, uh, uh, to the white room and it all blows out. So uh, even the door that goes to the white room is always cracked open a little bit to let the, uh, let the extra air out. This is uh, how to keep, uh, keep the particles uh, you know, from getting inside the spacecraft. So for the first launch attempt, to the left of the hatch uh, was a, a mission patch for CFT and Butch and Sunny took the time to sign that. Now they are heading straight into the ingressing process, which is again to get into the spacecraft. And we see pad team members there helping uh, get Butch situated. Uh, certainly, uh, the, this crew is uh, being the first to get to the Soyuz and, and to the American traditions and has a nice, uh, a nice blend to, to make something new. Uh, Roger, proceed. Yeah, in case a chip uh, gets broken or, or a glove is missing, uh, we have a few spares available. Team lead, I'll see. The uh, launch conductor is no, no, no. Go ahead. Yes, sir, for step 160. 16 personnel have exited the FHA roadblock. Roger. Just a call out there to mark that folks have uh, left uh, the pad uh, as well as the flight hazard area. So the area that's designated is where we don't want people to be if they don't have to be. So that's that call out there. And now we are watching Bush uh, getting settled into Starliner. And uh, Sunny is currently outside. What we'll see is uh, uh, Butch will fully ingress and get himself situated before Sunny ingresses. So to walk us through uh, what we're about to see with Butch, let's head back over to the ASOC with Lauren and Dylan. Hey Megan, yeah, we just saw a Butch sort of slide across the seats there to get into his captain seat. Um, that is what this first position is known here as. And um, Sunny, of course, will ingress second because her seat is just so but They just kind of showed us like if you were sitting in two chairs side by side and you had plenty of elbow room, that's how they feel. Um, in other spacecraft in the past, they've been a little more jammed in there. Uh, so they're really happy about the extra space they have in there. And Sunny won't start that ingress process until Butch is completely in and ready to go. Uh, this whole process takes about 20 minutes or so. Uh, these 
seats um, that they are going to be sitting in today are built to accommodate them, um, but they will be landing on their backs uh, in Starliner when they touch down on the ground, which has, um, since the shuttle day has been determined to be just a little bit of an easier uh, way to land. So uh, she and Butch are very happy about that. Um, we do have other seats in Starliner. The third and fourth seats are filled with cargo. To the hatch there, carefully, and the two pad team members that are inside the capsule who have been helping Butch get in will now do this exact same steps for her, essentially. Exactly. It's a little bit easier here uh, because Butch is uh, fully ensconced behind the integrated crew uh, control panel. Uh, they have a little bit uh, extra room from the side to work with uh, to work with Sunny, so that's uh, that's going to make it a, a little bit easier process. But the nice thing about this is that we've we've practiced this a lot now, and uh, I know Sunny's uh, feeling happy, and we just got to watch out, Butch. He might take a small micro nap here because he's all set and ready to go, but uh, Sunny's still getting strapped in and uh, we've gone through this procedure a lot a micro nap so so just an opportunity to kind of you know decompress a little bit or it's a it's a little bit of a zen moment uh, and it uh, just helps uh, it, it, it's scientifically proven that I've read that uh, it helps uh, helps a quick recharge because uh, they still have a whole full day in front of them uh, to get into orbit and uh, to get headed towards the space station. They'll have a chance to sleep overnight. And uh, it's always hard to sleep in a new place, especially when you're adapting. Roger. Roger, understand, uh, and that's the result of us uh, not copying at this point. Are all four, four of those uh, OTCs Delta B related? Yes, sir, they are. Yes. Okay, uh, let's continue to monitor that while we're uh, troubleshooting the uh, the talking valve. Wait. I copy. Right. I think that was uh, some conversation that talked about uh, you know, with the, the their stop. They stopped topping the, the second stage, the Centaur uh, tanks. So they are uh, uh, they are receiving some uh, some more telemetry saying, "Hey, we're not being topped right now." And uh, so they're saying, "Yep, that's that. We, that makes sense to us. We're gonna, they're going to continue troubleshooting." So if you remember, Butch ingressed first, and then Sunny stayed in the white room. While she was in the white room, she made a phone call to Zach Brandon. And he's the lead technician on Starliner's crew module. Talking about how hard the team worked, they, they deserve a little time off, so you guys took Memorial Day weekend to, to kind of recharge. And they have two daughters. As a naval pilot, Butch racked up more than 8,000 flight hours and 663 carrier landings, all in tactical jet aircraft. He completed four operational deployments, supporting missions like Operation Desert Storm. Before his selection to NASA, Wilmore was on exchange to the Air Force as a flight test instructor at the Air Force Test Pilot School at Edwards Air Force Base in California. Butch is a veteran of two space flights as a pilot on Space Shuttle Atlantis in 2009, and then in 2014, he served as flight engineer for Expedition 41. And so far, Wilmore has spent 178 days in space and performed four spacewalks. This flight test will be his third mission to the ISS. And Sunny Williams, CMP's pilot and a retired U.S. Navy captain. NASA selected her as an astronaut in 1998, just two years before Butch. So this will be Sunny's third mission to space, making her the first woman on a test flight of an orbital spacecraft. Her first trip to the ISS launched in 2006. She served as flight engineer for Expeditions 1415. She then returned to the orbiting lab in 2012 and was commander of Expedition 33. Sunny has more than 50 hours of spacewalk time, the second most cumulative time by a female astronaut. So far, she has spent 322 days in space. Before NASA, Sunny was a former naval test pilot and instructor, logging more than 3,000 flight hours in more than 30 different aircraft. Williams grew up in Eden, Massachusetts, and is married to Michael Williams. Starliner in Houston on one. Uh, good pressure, the side hatch is being configured now. Audible noises may be heard. Leak check complete. You can open the vent valve. All right, great. That's in one. We're commanding Alpha on and then off at this time. Morning, Paul. 
All right. Let me see. And what still box is that? So you know. All right. So you hear this troubleshooting happening in real time. They are moving forward with everything else while they troubleshoot. Starline are on internal power now. The spacecraft is running completely on its own. Ordnance has also been configured for launch. Okay. That means yeah. the devices that initiate our separation yeah, events. Uh, Bravo, Alpha is also working to clear LCT condition. And uh, for the crew, you can take visors down. Visors down and orbit free. copy, folks. All right, it's got to feel good to put those visors down now. So when yeah. we were seeing that big visual cue, the uh, crew access arm retracting, it takes about two minutes to uh, retract and stow 120 degrees away from uh, Starliner back against the crew access tower. Uh, in the event of an emergency, it can be uh, redeployed in less than 15 seconds. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. We don't want to see it do that, but we, we're glad it can if it needs to. And we have a couple of poles coming up here in about two minutes, the launch vehicle pole launch vehicle management pole. Yeah, Lauren, that's right at uh, L minus eight minutes uh, next door. Everything looking good? All steps are complete prior to status check. 355. Ground pyro is enabled. Launch pad ordnance circuits are now enabled. Hold, hold, hold. Flight control received the CCLS, hold it. Approximately T minus 350. LC switch not ready. All personnel turn to recycle section. Operation 80. LC switch is not ready. Clock stop at T minus 3 minutes 50 seconds. Starliner, uh, you should not hear a, uh, any vents at this point. Starliner, standing by. ALC, reset countdown clock to T-minus four minutes and holding. Active. LC, PD2. Go ahead. Sensor tank pressures are stable. Roger. LC, PD1. Go ahead. Atlas tank pressures are stable. Roger. OSM, place SRB ignition SNA switch to disabled position. SRB ignition disabled. Okay, consoles, uh, step 60, report launch vehicle status. Atlas lead. Atlas tank pressures and UA bottles stable. Atlas pulse system stable. Roger. Centaur lead. Centaur tank pressures and helium bottles stable. Centaur propulsion system stable. Has gas readings nominal. Roger. Vehicle electrical. B channel one. A bounding system stable. Roger. And LC can verify no indications of hazard. Flight LC. LC Starliner system stable. Roger. Starliner last arm switch to off. Last arm switch is off. FCS in pre-flight mode, SS FAPS then active, OCU safe and EDS in test mode. Roger. Arm control, deploy the crew access arm. Roger. Starliner, proceed with ordnance deactivation. Active one. is safe. Verified. Okay, all stations recycle systems back to T-4 and holding configuration. Hold time occurred at T-3 minutes 50 seconds. Report status at completion. And flight LC. LC. CST 100 power to external. Copy. We'll put it there. LC left one. Go ahead. Subset Bravo, Atlas LF2, continue to copy. Roger. LC plus two. Go ahead. Subset call. Center LO2, continue to copy. Roger. LC, field two. Go ahead. Centaur LH2, continuing topping. Roger. 
Oh, one. Go ahead, PNE one. At Lake Pneumatic, pressure stable. Roger. LC, PNE two. Go ahead. Substep Echo, CEC active. Roger. And substep Foxtrot, sensor pneumatic system stable. Roger. Oh, can you drop one? Go ahead. Substep Charlie and substep Delta, outage propulsion and hydraulic system stable. Roger. LC, ECS. Go ahead. Substep November, ECS set point stable. Roger. LC, this flight control. Go ahead. Subset Kilo, flight control ready. Roger. If you're just joining us here at the Cape Cod Naval Space Force Station, uh, Draxus Arm is deployed. Roger. We did have a uh, automatic hold of our our uh, ground launch sequencer, and uh, shortly after we began our terminal count for today's launch attempt, uh, no indication yet as to uh, what caused that hold of the uh, automatic ground launch sequencer. The team is still evaluating data. In the meantime, the uh, the team is active. Uh, recycling the vehicle to a, uh, um, a a good holding state so that we can prepare for our uh, next steps. LC has gas. Go ahead, gas. Substep hotel has gas. Normal scan pattern including cat. Roger. Hey, in flight, LC. Channel one. Flight. Yeah. Roger. Uh, secure CST-100 prompt system. Last valve to remain open. Like flight copies. How do you take us to the fleet five minutes here? Yeah, come. We're going to send it over to uh, NASA's Daryl Nail over at Hangar E for some continuing coverage of our FTS Daryl. Thanks, Dylan. And I'm listening to the NASA operations yeah, manager's lead. The mission of the Commercial Crew Program is to provide transportation for astronauts to the International Space Station. Multiple providers provide you redundancy. Redundancy is important, as we know, in our systems. We have redundant systems. But actually, more importantly, it's providing the aerospace workforce the opportunity to test out new ideas, new technologies, and work them into spacecraft. Butch and I are the first two to fly the Starliner, so this flight will be a crew flight test. So there will only be two on board. We're going to fly it up to the space station, dock it, and test it all out, and then come back home. Everything's new. The procedures are new. We have procedures now that we didn't have a year ago because we've learned as the process has gone forward. We've had two test flights uncrewed previously, but this will be the first time we're putting people on it. We're test pilots, and so we're going to be testing the spacecraft in all aspects of the flight, from launch, on orbit, all the way to entry and landing. We're testing out the environmental control system. We're testing out the manual flying of the spacecraft. Then while we're docked to the space station, we have a bunch of tasks to make sure that the spacecraft can act as a lifeboat. And just in case anything bad goes on on the International Space Station, the crew on board can come to the Starliner and make sure that they're okay. This has a mode where we call it backup mode, which is your get home mode, if you will. We can, without any communication at all, we can still affect a, a return to Earth, do a deorbit burn, and hit the, the point where we're trying to land, even without our computers. You know, that old mantra, failure is not an option because it's a very dynamic thing we do flying in space and uh, it's not very forgiving and we know that and that's why we have these multiple systems and multiple redundant capabilities because human life is special and we want to preserve it at all costs. I think exploration is just in the human heart. Butch, he describes himself as the first thing he said as a kid was why and I think that's in all of us. Maybe we don't verbalize it but we all ask 
ask why, and that's what exploration is. It's that next step of why. So why not go back to the moon? Why not try to live on the moon? It seems like a natural stepping stone to the next thing, Mars, which just calls us. Like, why is that planet there? What is the future of that planet? What is the future of our planet? And to be able to take these next steps in exploration, we're going to start answering those questions. We stand on the pinnacle. This is kind of where all everything, integration, everything comes together, which is where Sunny and I sit. And this is just a part of the ongoing process of growing and expounding our knowledge and our understanding of all things for the benefit of mankind. I am Sunny Williams, and I am ready to fly NASA's Boeing Crew Flight Test. I'm Butch Wilmore, and I am ready to fly NASA's Boeing Crew Flight Test. The crew of Butch Wilmore and Sonny Williams, who are inside the capsule at the top of this rocket, as you can see here, are safe and are awaiting. Do you see a shot of them? There's Sonny on the left and Butch on the right. They are awaiting the arrival of the blue team to come out to the launch pad and help them egress which essentially means get out of the Starliner capsule and head back to crew quarters. It's a process that requires uh, that team to do some manual work to lock in the crew access arm to the Starliner capsule. There, the shot there, arriving back. This is the team that will head back up the launch tower and up into the white room. They will uh, secure the crew access arm to Boeing Starliner, open up the hatch, and get the astronauts out. Just prior to this, 20, 30 minutes or so, uh, we've been listening to the ULA team safe the Atlas V vehicle. basically going through a number of steps to make sure that uh, you know, the tanks for liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen, the RP-1 propellant, make sure everything is in a safe configuration before they allow this crew uh, to get on the pad. And you see the van there with the 321 backing up uh, to the launch tower. To four in front of us. Yeah, I think that's uh, a perfect way to put it. You know, it's okay to be disappointed. It's it's perfectly understandable. But at the same time, you can absolutely hear the professionalism and and uh, how uh, quickly uh, folks are, are responding to this and, and moving forward to the next opportunity. Dee, what are your thoughts, uh, again, from Boeing's perspective as uh, we wait for Bush and Sunny to come out of the Starliner spacecraft? Uh, you know, of course, I think it echoes what we've all heard. Um, you know, this is disappointing. We really wanted to see a liftoff today. But, you know, a, a reminder today, even during uh, this attempt, you know, it takes dozens, if not hundreds of things to go right for us to get to T minus zero. You know, that wasn't today. But the good news is we get to try again. So, you know, teams, I'm sure at this point are focused on uh, the scrubbing uh, sequence and, and the, you know, all the things we have to do to to try again tomorrow or whenever that date may be. Um, so we're focused and, um, you know, just going through the process, a, a simulation, see that, that, you know, a process we've gone through, through many, many simulations um, until again, we, we get to try to do this again. Looks like uh, Sunny is out of the spacecraft and uh, she's gonna put some protective covers uh, on her on her shoes and uh, and uh, we'll take her uh, some items from her for her put it back in her helmet bag and it looks like uh, Butch is, uh, is is about to be heading out uh, also uh, they're gonna uh, they're gonna uh, go back to crew quarters at this time and uh, get ready to do it again when uh, when the time is right. And uh, you were there uh, when they returned to crew quarters on May 6th after the first launch attempt. Can you talk to us about uh, their demeanor then? Uh, yes, they were, uh, uh, you, you could tell that uh, they had had a long day. But the, they actually had a little bit of a smile on their face, which uh, I was, uh, I don't say I was surprised, but I was like glad to see. It gave me, it made me feel a little bit better about things too, because uh, you know, they, they do bring the whole team with them. And, uh, and uh, they've been, they've had a great attitude during the, during the whole long quarantine period. So hopefully this is a, a shorter round. 
um, and getting ready for for the next time. Next time. Um, and D, you, you, you said it right, you know, practice uh, doesn't make perfect, but it makes us a lot better. And uh, we, got, we learned a lot of uh, good things about our rocket and our spacecraft today. So the next launch, uh, launch countdown should be that much more smoother and, uh, and we're that much more practiced, which is good because a Starliner 1 is going to be coming, Starliner 2 is going to be coming, Starliner 3 is going to be coming. And all not, they can make that launch opportunity. You see Sunny walking across the crew access arm now. Back into the white room where a pad team member is helping her to put back on her helmet. Uh, the, uh, or the cover. The visor cover, yes. Yeah. And that's to make sure it doesn't scratch, nothing scratches. Yes, right? it's uh, it's very frustrating to have a visor that's uh, scratchy and then it's hard to replace, so uh, we protect them carefully. And uh, so they'll, uh, they'll be able to make it back to the suit room where, this, uh, where the crew will get uh, unsuited and uh, the suits will get uh, cleaned and dried, get ready for the next, uh, next uh, time to go launch. Uh, get out of their undergarments and uh, take a quick shower, get, uh, get refreshed. And here they come, out of the elevators again. See, they have their white booties on there. That's uh, to, to make a great opportunity to have the, the families come by. I, I, I think uh, Butch and Sonny are staying quarantined. There, turning around, driving away now from the crew access tower. Again, a short drive back to crew quarters, about 15, 20 minutes. At launching NASA's Boeing crew flight test. At around three minutes, an automatic hold was triggered by the ground launch sequencer. And that GLS for short is the computer that launches the rocket because it controls all the systems needed in the final moments of the countdown. So if you remember when we were in terminal count and you heard the teams calling out uh, and saying, you know, this is done, this is done, kind of ticking off things off the checklist. It was a ground launch sequencer, right, Mike? That was, that were, were triggering all of those, of those steps. That's the instructor. And he is a veteran of two space flights as pilot on Space Shuttle Atlantis in 2009. And then in 2014, he served as a flight engineer for Expedition 41. So CFT will be his third mission to the ISS. And then... Joining us, uh, there was uh, uh, a decision to stand down from today's launch attempt at 12.25 p.m. Eastern of NASA's uh, Boeing crew flight test. Uh, we have walked you through uh, uh, the, the, the hours leading up to that decision to stand down and also uh, so that we could watch Butch and Sunny get out of the Starliner spacecraft and now they are safely back uh, at crew quarters. Uh, before we wrap up, uh, my... again, thank you everyone for watching. We have a press conference planned for 3 p.m. Eastern Time on NASA Plus, NASA TV, our social media channels, where again, we will share anything that we can with you about uh, the developing uh, situation we have uh, here at, uh, at uh, Kennedy Space Center. But for now, thank you again for watching, and we'll see you when we launch.